Bataras, sitting second, no preferred in Thank you so much. bloodshed has always been because of brothers and sisters fighting over the same religion, not because of different religions. So, we just want to observe three things in the opening government case. The first is simply on individual fulfillment. People are happier and consolidate religions with somewhat more different religions. Secondly is you have much less religious conflict. And third is you have much better social change for progression. Some clarifications in this debate. So the first thing is this is not about if we should have one religion or many religions. It's about the nature and the size of these religions as well as how they deal with internal division. Do they split off from the larger religion? Do they try and stay within that religion and compete over having very civil doctrines? Or do they try and become their own religion? And similarly, this doesn't mean that doctrines and beliefs never change. It simply means the constituencies that they're trying to fight for, the constituencies that they're attending, attending to, tend to be larger on our side because they're for a larger religion rather than for opposition where they tend to be in smaller and smaller sets. Having said this, we move to the first argument, which is simply individual fulfillment. The thesis of this argument is that the believers of any individual religion are more fulfilled, more supported by that religion, and have a greater access to resources. We want to first situate this argument before we move on to why it's true, so just to prove that it's important. So the first thing is that this is a very, very short argument. If you're unsure about the rest of the classes in this debate about conflict, about social change, then you can just believe that people are fulfilling their purpose, they're quite happy, and beyond that, this is the main purpose in your life, to find a purpose, and you know, to have a vocation, have a community, and all that stuff. Having said that, there are three key benefits to a unified church that tend to make people happier. The first is that there are simply less co constant religious self-doubt. That is, you're more confident in your interpretation of your religion, you're less doubting about your role in that community, and you're more happy because you feel connected to God because you're closer to that priest, for example. Secondly is that resource pooling allows individuals on the ground to benefit from building churches, for example, benefit from economies of scale when it comes to things like soup kitchens or international donations to allow people to be lifted out of poverty and have schools and so on, which benefits from the larger <coughs> scale resource pooling. But thirdly, finally, is that the feeling of community allows you to feel safer and happier within yourself. It allows other people to support you. It allows you to draw from a greater network of resources and allows you to meet more people around the world and feel included with that community. I'm then going to next prove three reasons for why this is exclusive to government bench and why they can't say, oh, you can just have this with lots and lots of uh, sects within that religion. So the first thing is that this is exclusive. Different religions tend to be different, which means you don't feel that self-doubt from a different religion because you're secure in your own faith, rather than trying to contest the truth of that internal doctrine by saying there's a different flavor of that doctrine or contesting the history of that doctrine rather than the overall truth of it. The second is that the existence of differences between internal religion, uh, between ex external religions, are less, are more, are less proximate to your self-doubt than that one of your internal religion because it's your brother telling you that you should believe in something different. It's your priest saying that they might have potentially converted to a different sect and you should follow them. So that means that there's less doubt injected into you individually. But third thing finally is that there's an incentive between internal factions that share resources to try and strip away resources from other sect, which creates a vicious competition. The most prominent example of where this internal religious conflict is most likely to occur is, you know, the example of the Vatican, where they would strip away resources, they would excommunicate the other individuals because the fact that they contested that definition of Arianism, for example, or of the Trinitarianism, for example, or different in religious beliefs about the Trinity, and about Mother Mary, whether or not she's like, you know, ascended and different from all the other saints. So, these are the three things that make it exclusive, so OP has to push against that, and we've shown to you that there's a massive benefit here. How do you weigh these impacts within the round? The first is that this religious comfort and solace is the most important thing in your life.
individual because it dictates whether or not you are happy, whether or not any material benefit, any conflict is even worth it to you in the first place. Secondly, more importantly, it's prerequisite to the argue, other arguments. If you are unstable, if you're unsure about your own life, even if off might show that maybe external sex or somewhat more opposition to each other, this is all hinged on whether or not you feel comfortable enough or safe in your life such that you would be willing to die for it or fight for it. The comparative is that on government, when you're happier in your life, when you're safe in your life, you don't feel the need to pick up arms. So this argument is the root of the debate. We win it instantly. We now move on to the second argument in this speech, which is religious conflict. I'll take a few out of closing opposition, though. Uh, do you think Islam and Catholicism taught people inherently to be evil or violent, killing bombs? No, I don't think they do. I don't think different religions are inherently evil. What I think what ends up happening is that differences inside these religions create instability that makes them fight one another and makes them fight other religions. So having said that, we move to the second argument. Religious conflict. Interreligious conflict, sorry, intra-religious conflict is much more likely to be vicious, structurally worse, and more likely overall than inter-religious conflict. There are three comparative reasons for this. So it's not just proving an absolute change, but rather that on opposition it's way more likely when there are internal divisions that tend to be much more large. So the first thing is that the dif differences in belief are, and, um, are much closer to you, which means that you feel much more proximate to these divisions in belief. That means that you feel like they're challenging something sacred to you. It feels like they're really challenging your idea of God because of the fact that they're fighting over the characterization of that God rather than suggesting a new God entirely, which means you feel more aggrieved, more angry about certain things, which means you're much more likely to get up in arms about it. Secondly is that there are limited resources that the same religion are trying to fight over. So for example, things like the same relics, the same mosques, the same religious land that you're fighting over, because they share the same history and the same doctrine, but they have different beliefs about the doctrine, or they even have different doctrines about that same land, which means that they're much more likely to vicious in competition over that same land. Thirdly, finally, is that major religions tend to be themselves more vicious to one another when they are internally divided. So if obsessed major religions are bad to one another, the problem is that internal divisions tend to make them more unstable, which means they feel the need to express that insecurity in others and get more resources for themselves. Which means if obsessed major religions are bad, they get comparatively worse when they're internally divided. Having said that, this means if one fights tend to be more likely, they get to get worse over time because they're more and more brutal, because you feel more aggrieved over things and you're willing to fight to the death over it, because it's very, very important land to you and very important belief to you, and there are these that these fights tend to get longer. Which which means one, in many of the most vulnerable states in the world where this religious conflict is proximate, where it gets, you know, it's, it's really, really bad, it gets substantially worse over time, it never ends because they feel aggrieved over it, it means that many people are deprived of basic rights and liberties. Maybe Op might be able to prove some marginal change in whatever thing here, but the problem is that this is a very, very large harm, such that maybe it only affects a million people, two million people in the world, but it's still enough to win the debate because of the fact that it's so vicious and harmful, such that we would not want to have it, you know, even be prolonged or get worse. The third and final thing is argument is social change and radicalism. So maybe sometimes religions are good, sometimes religions are bad. When they are unified, they tend to be better over time and less radicalized over time. Sects in opposition, internal to the religion, tend to be more radical and get worse when they are internally divided. One, because there's no interaction with moderate sects, which means they're appealing to smaller and smaller pools of people, which means echo chambers tend to naturally rise that cause them to make more and more radical ideas. Second means that the recruiting strategy forcibly changes because they have to deepen that recruitment internally, which means they have to become more and more radical in order to retain these members rather than expanding. And third thing finally is that the differentiation tends to get worse because of the fact that it's negative differentiation because they're trying to compete over who has the most right doctor, which means proving them wrong rather than becoming more liberal and being progressive and changing. So comparative is that on government side, longer and larger and more unified religions tend to be less radical exclusive because they represent more and more people from different backgrounds because more and more people tend to get escalated into different sets of power and the power tends to be diffused among, among more people, which means there's more checks and balances, more accountability, and more peace. Opening government. I thank the Prime Minister for the wonderful speech. Now moving on to the leader of the opposition. Here, here. I will also just speak from here if that's okay with everybody.
Daniel, we don't think OG can say that radicalization within religion is likely to be completely mitigated simply because there is a unified church that exists. If the alternative to radicalization, uh, as to like, if radicals cannot form a different sect for their religious interpretation to propagate their conflict that they wanted to, or to engage in any acts of aggression, we think even within a unified church, they would very easily be able to do that. That is literally how people separated and created the Church of England, engaged in large-scale wars across Europe historically, simply because there was a, a push for unification, a push that there can be only one church and one interpretation, and that is literally why large-scale conflict ensued. So we don't think that the only burden on us is to prove to you why radicalization is likely to be lower on our side, because we, like on, on both sides of the house, that harm is likely to be the same. My case has two pushes. I'll engage firstly with religion as something that is personal and how it impacts the individual, and secondly with religion as an organization with social implications. Let's talk about fulfillment and faith. We th intuitively, we can say that all religion is likely to be inherently conservative because there is always going to be a push towards preserving doctrine and dogma that has existed for thousands of years. If this push towards being inherently conservative exists, it means that older generations of people are at the top tiers of the administration of this religion itself, irrespective of whether it is a unified church or not. And if that is the case, we think the lowest common denominator in David's speech should not be the people who are just going to be, say, happy, find community or find support. We think it should be those people who face the most cognitive dissonance within the scope of that religion. This includes people who want to be atheists, who are, who are, who have had like uh, 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 who are teenagers and have had to get, had to get abortions, who have like uh, like sexual urges. Like the Bible tells you not to masturbate. These are sexual urges that every single individual has to like go through. Or even things such as being a part of the LGBTQ community. Experiences that come at a very key age, at the, at the age of adolescence, young adults who have to go through situations where they have been raised in extremely conservative families. We think this conservative experience is like likely to be so much more when we have a unified church that is so much more conservative because you don't even have access or any sort of discourse or any sort of media portrayal of how religions can be liberal and interact with each other within themselves. If that is the case, then this cognitive dissonance, that experience for these individuals is so much worse. What does this mean? This means that like, inherently these kids are raised from a young age to do things such as pray before dinner because otherwise God will not give you food anymore or you will go to hell if you do this, 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 this. The fear of hell is imbibed in young children even before they're taught basic education or put into the schooling system. Which means at the key crucial stage where these children are still dependent on their parents, have done sinful things that their unified church as well as their own conservative families are telling them that is inherently bad and that they are going to now go to hell. That level of cognitive dissonance mean they, means that they have no opt-out. What, and then now they're, they're facing family backlash, they think they're going to go to hell, and they're facing an identity crisis. Why is different interpretation better? Which means even if this child is likely to be bad, works in both situations, at least in our, in, in our case, this child is able to say, Google things such as, is like being gay not Christian? Is having to get an abortion not Christian? And because there is likely to be some access to literature through the existence of literal yeah. interpretations of the same doctrine, the existence of Thing, uh, the existence of, of even getting to know that there are gay churches, that there are all women popes, all of these things through uh, through different denominations of the same religion inherently mean that these people are able to find some sort of opt out from this cognitive dissonance. At least if that at that stage in their life, before they turn 18, can move out, get exposed to the rest of the world, at the age, at the young age of 13 and 14, at least if they're able to Google these things and know that yes, there are gay churches, yes, being like me having these urges means that I'm not a bad Christian and that I might not go to hell, that at least mitigates that level of cognitive dissonance for the worst actor that David does not even deal with. What then is the, uh, let's move to the next point then, as to how we mitigate conflict and how like, uh, like the social aspects of this religion are likely to be worse off. I've already told you that this unified religion is likely to be more uh, conservative than any sort, of, uh, any sort of other interpretation. Because we inherently think that interactions within religion bring reform and liberalization. We think it brings like uh, it, it, it brings like every member of this religion to sort of reevaluate what their idea of their own scripture is, what their idea of their own upbringing within that religion is, and in, inherently, at least within their mind, casts a certain amount of doubt as to whether or not their religion is the best ideal interpretation of what this like what this doctrine should be. And note that this argument is not an isolation, which means we're not having a debate as popes here as to what the best interpretation of uh, of the Bible should be. This is how we place this old dogma and doctrine in the current world that we live in, in a, in a world where religion just has not been able to keep up with these other social circles that religion never contemplated would overpower it. Things such as the existence of social media, the existence of like uh, like minority movements, the existence of like even science and how it, it can challenge your own ideas and beliefs simply on the basis of pure facts. 
All of these inherently mean that we are exposed to a lot more information, a lot more truths and falses outside of the scope of religion as to what one Bible or one God is telling you to do over the course of your life. If that is the case, we inherently think that simply having a mechanism where different sects and interpretations of the same doctrine can exist in this world challenges the very basic foundation that religion is the be all and end all and that if this church chooses one interpretation and will do anything to preserve that interpretation by David's very own argument excommunicating every single person who wants to have a differing opinion or even having backlash against the people who want to come and say oh I don't believe in this because that sort of backlash is going to be so much worse as opposed to any opt out mechanism from that or even just the idea that, that I am seeing the news and hearing interpretations of liberal popes who have a different a differing opinion on abortion and rethinking my own upbringing within this religion, I take those. All your arguments are against religion in general, because religion is generally conservative as you claim. Google isn't mutually exclusive, so I'm not exactly sure they're not a In your world of a unified religion, your unified religion is actively suppressing any literature or any interpretation that is liberal in nature. If there is no information on Google available saying that being gay and being Christian can coexist, why will this child be better off in your world? Uh, let's move on to the next part then. We, tell, we think that the mechanics of this also inherently mean that doctrine becomes more solidified in their world as opposed to ours. We think like the world that we live in now is increasingly moving towards one where we are re-evaluating old relics of our past, talking about whether this is socially relevant anymore and doing away with dogma and doing away with, like, with practices that aren't good anymore. This looks like abolishing the sati practice or even child marriage and dowry system in Hinduism which is prevalent across all India, uh, all of India because it like percolates into the very structure of society itself. If this is one, one of these examples of how we're doing away with this doctrine to the point where we can make it extinct, we think that mechanism never exists on their side because their doctrine is now written in stone. Because one set of individuals who have been elected and are continuously being replaced by the same sort of people through an electoral process that is never actually fair are going to continuously preserve the same interpretations of the doctrine which we actively challenge and allow people to opt out of. And that sort of mechanism is better because it fixes the power asymmetry that inherently exists within a church, and a unified church that wants to keep continuing the same practices. Extremely proud. I thank the Opposition tells you that religions are problematic because they are conservative, because they are restrictive, and because they strip you of the ability to freely choose an ideology that aligns with your preferences. But they don't explain in the counterfactual why you're able to pick and choose a sect. A person born into the most conservative sect of Christianity in the Midwest cannot leave that sect and cannot become a mainstream Catholic. And it's because of the very mechanisms we explained, David, with no response from them, that when you are, uh, differentiate, when you split off, you have to differentiate yourself not just from other religions but also from people within your religion you have to breed hatred for people that believe in the same gods you have to explain why doctrines should be more rigid should be more restrictive and should be less free to access which is why in their world people are far less fulfilled which is why they get more conflict to no response from them two things in this speech let's speak firstly about fulfillment and radicalization their claim is that when there are more sects within a religion, you're freer to access an interpretation that suits your preferences and that might be more accepting of you. The problem with this, firstly, is that it assumes you're able to leave the original sect that you are assigned to, which simply isn't true. And in fact, I'd say the opposite happens in their world. You're less able to leave the original sect. And this is for three reasons. First, because the pressure to differentiate forces you yourself to internalize radical beliefs about other people within your religion. So even if you could Google something about a progressive interpretation of Catholicism, there's no reason that you would believe them or trust them when your parents from a very young age have told you that they are false shepherds, they are people leading you astray, and that they are trying to pervert the very things you hold on to. Whereas in our world, where there is a single unified belief, even if you might not be a part of the most progressive part within that religion, there's a baseline level of trust to say we are all part of the same church, we are united, we are a single community, you interact with us on a day-to-day, 
and therefore you should be willing to listen to what I have to say. But secondly, I point out that these individualized sects have to set up physical barriers to exit in addition to the main barriers the religion sets up. So it's not just that you can't leave your community, it's that you're prevented from entering the churches of other sects within that religion. Like if you are a Sunni Muslim, you don't consume the same interpretations that Shia Muslims do because you believe that itself to be a sin. So it's in their world where you're actually exposed to less interpretations because you prevent yourself preemptively from considering them valid. But thirdly, I point out that in many instances you just don't inter you just don't listen to the interpretations even when they're available because your initial response is to turn back to the members of your original set. So there's a way up here. Even if you could access progressive interpretations of Christianity, there's no reason they, they become the ones that are most influential to your life. It's in their world where you default to seeing the people within your sect as the most credible, the most trustworthy, which is why you're sent back into the same cycle of radicalization. Whereas in our world, people regardless of their specific interpretation of the religion are believed to have an equal level of credibility, which is why you can turn to them as a more trustworthy actor, which is why you're less radicalized. Why in the comparative is radicalization far less likely within religions? We point out they don't deal with the change in the motion, which is the types of doctrines religion set out in the first place become very different in our world. We explain that they're far more likely to be neutral, far less likely to be controlling of individual lifestyle choices, and far more likely to be broad-based religious narratives like do moral good, follow the Ten Commandments, etc. And this is for a series of reasons. First, because religious leaders are forced to appeal to a broader base of believers, so they're forced to moderate to a greater extent. When the, like, take the observation of the most extreme examples, like cults. You're able to like, radicalize and extremize the version of the beliefs you hold because those believers are insulated and because you can keep feeding them more and more radical things. In our world, all it takes is the contestation of one moderate, one reasonable guy within that faith, which is why you can't extremize to the same degree. But secondly, there are far stronger accountability mechanisms that develop in our world as a result of there being a broader base of believers who want to kick you out at any given moment. So in their world, when one priest can set himself up as the all-knower, who can set himself up as a pseudo-pope and gain all control over that, there's no one else with an equal degree of authority who can step in and take him out. In our world, you're far more likely to develop, to develop formal processes by which you vet the beliefs that other priests are setting out, like in the Vatican, like in the Catholic Church, where you have a rigid hierarchical structure which explains what the beliefs should be and has layers of accountability at every step. But thirdly, I point out that it's actually in our world that progressive inter interpretations gain ground more rapidly, and this is because of the very interaction mechanism they themselves explain. It's in our world where you're part of a bigger community, you don't see those people as different from you, so you have more discussions of doctrine to begin with rather than shutting them out preemptively. And even in the worst case, if people want to leave the religion, I think that's far better for progressivizing religions. So in their world, if you're gay and you really don't think Christianity is working for you, you're able to take a piecemeal interpretation that says, maybe it's okay to be gay, but I can't have gay sex. You don't force the religion to progressivize because you allow them into these small opt-outs that don't actually deal with the core problem that keeps the religion conservative. In our world, religions are forced to adapt right away because the alternative for the believer is to leave. I point out at the end of this, even if you're unsure as to what the changes in doctrine in individual religions are, you have to weigh on the scale of resources and network they can give you. We give people far better access to religious social services, to things like donation drives, simply because there are far more of us in a far broader range of the world, which is why even if nothing changes doctrinally, we change their lives materially. I'll take closing first. In Islam, there's different doctrines that rose up from different living conditions. How do you decide which doctrine of practices is the one you choose on government side? Through a formalized process of discussion and debate that doesn't manifest in conflict as you had in the Vatican. Because there's an incentive to keep people peaceful because you recognize that they won't split off and they can't split off because that's the world that exists. So you have to set up things like debate chambers, you have to set up things like formal appeals process, says rather than in your world where you can say, I've had enough of you guys, I'm going to build my own sect within this religion, I am the one true God. Secondly, the Let's talk about religious conflict. There are two sorts of conflicts to consider. The first is conflict between religious sects that to this point opposition simply has no response to. And that itself is debate winning because David explains why conflict between sects is often far more violent, far more vicious, and far more personal than any sort of conflict that exists. It's the fact of the Sunni-Shia divide that means Iran and Saudi Arabia set up proxy conflicts in the rest of the world, which is far worse and far more prolonged than any conflict between Christianity and Islam ever was. But secondly, the conflict between different major religions. And I'd actually explain that these types of conflicts get more common in their world for a series of reasons. One, the instability of not knowing whether the believers will continue to support them as a 
particular leadership breeds insecurity that motivates them to find a scapegoat. So the reason you had the Crusades wasn't because you hated Islam. They lived millions of miles away and didn't compete over resources. It's because you were afraid of other Christians not believing you enough. So you had to create a boogeyman. You had to create a devil and say it was the other religion and tell people to go after them. But secondly, because in their world, all it takes is one radical sect. All it takes is one ISIS to get discrimination against all Muslims, to get conflict against all Muslims, to portray them as an enemy and to portray them as no grounds. For all of these reasons, propose. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for the one hundred speech. Now moving on to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Okay, here. Yeah. Preferably from closing in the fifth minute. And I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Panel, we think we get three main pushes from opening government. One about fulfillment in religion, one about like how resources will get divided and which, like on which side do like indi individual religious people have access to more resources, and lastly on religious conflict, right? We think in the two speeches that we have from opening government, they're unable to ever really quantify to you or even qualify to you what religious re, uh, religious fulfillment looks like for an individual, other than to say, like in the first minute of their speech, that like you have to be more fulfilled because it allows you to have purpose. We can't come and tell you that religion is extremely personal to an individual. So a chunk of their arguments about like you will have to like say no to your neighbor or say no to your brother or say no to your priest when like you, you your religious beliefs are different from like the major religious belief. We think it we think while we understand the harms of that, we think that the harms on our, like on their side where you're unable to tell yourself whether or not you're part of the religion are far worse, right? We think that in like the cognitive dissonance and the in, like the lack of ability to sort of like inter like to understand what whether or not you're even part of the religion happens more on their side and we think like that's more than right? But like what do they come and tell you about like uh, in general, we think like on our case, in, in, in our side of the world, we don't think at any point we need to change the religion to wait for reform. If I'm a, if I'm at the intersection of like Islam or like Hinduism or Christianity, and I'm, I'm like a minority, I'm a black LGBTQ woman, I think I'm less likely to want to change the religion or have, have like almost no ability to change the religion on side government side, which means that I lose out on community, I lose out on resources, because all the resources that they talk about in terms of distribution, in terms of we'll give them access to churches, to schools, to like welfare benefits, Benefits, who is holding these resources? Resources are held by the majority sect, even within a unified, like unified religion, right? We don't think that like resources are distributed based on like, oh, the religion is unified, doctrine is unified, everybody has the same resources. We think resources will necessarily be like hierarchically in a hierarchy divided into different communities, even under uh, under a world where the religious doctrine is unified. We think then in the access of resources to this individual who is at the intersection of religion and uh, an LGBTQ community is just absolutely not there. But what is the comparative, and this is extremely important because it takes on a bunch of what they tell you, right? We think on our side of the world, we have the ability to simply leave that particular sect of religion which does not accept uh, like LGBTQ individuals, which does not accept like people of color, which does not accept like people because of class differences and join a different sect which does, right? And their argument of like, oh, they're going to be like leader, like your leaders will like have to like necessarily radicalize you against other sect leaders. We think that exists even on their side because it's not that a unified like dogma or unified doctrine of religion means that there is no internal separation. On their side of the world, the internal separation has no recourse. On mine, I have another set of community to go to. Their argument then is, oh, it's really difficult to leave because unless I can prove to you that you can actually leave, you, you won't be able to get any benefit. We don't think that's true. On their side of the world, there is no sect where I am, where I continue to remain a Muslim or continue to remain a Hindu, and I'm part of an, and I'm part of the LGBTQ community, or I'm able to like get an abortion without like people people telling me that I'm going to hell. On their side, that's not possible. On mine, there is going to be at least one community, albeit small, albeit with like less resources, but somebody that I'm able to go to and seek that kind of fulfillment, seek that kind of like compassion, community, fraternity. Why do we then think that resources will come to these people? We think that these individual communal, like individual sects of the religion with religious leaders 
and political leaders, because political leaders are what will get you funds and resources and access to infrastructure. We think all of this is better on our side because there's incentive to take care of the subscription of that religious sect that you have, albeit small. <coughs> we think on their side you're completely ostracizing and like exclude like you completely like exclude them from any kind of political discourse. You completely exclude them from any kind of access to resources and we don't think like they're able to combat that, right? We think then on, on the idea that like competition for resources causing conflict, right? We think good competition on the basis of which sect has the most subscription is a decent enough competition. We're not like that's a trade-off we're able to make. We don't think all competition is bad. We think increasingly this will become about the version of religion that best fits into today's world. So the overall development, growth, liberalization, and like acceptance of religion is better on our side, something that they cannot promise to you, right? We think in the long run, we're able to make religion uh, something that is relevant in today's time, somewhere it has most number of subscribers to its like while like not eradicating its original like original tenets, but also making them more compatible with today's time. We think the alternatives to settle dispute over property continue to exist on our side of the world in the idea of like, courts. We think like there are democratic like constitutional ways in which all of this can be resolved. And on the next idea, like the next push that we get, so I think we take them on fulfillment because we think it's too too individual and we don't think they provide enough analysis. I told you our resources are better on our side, but why then do the religious conflict that they come and tell you. They come and tell you that inter-religious conflict is more vicious than inter-religious conflict. Their reasoning for this is that limited resources within the set uh, resources are divided, you will fight more. I already told you why even within a community, the, the resources are, are hierarchical, whether on class, whether on like access in terms of like, geographical location or what have you. And for all of these reasons, they will continue to be like fights about it. But why then do we think that there is a benefit or there is a possibility that the intra-religious conflict allows for religious to be able to consolidate better. We think the potential for reform, the potential for liberalization, the potential for just more acceptance to gain individual sect subscription, all of these things are better on our side. The ability to leave and join shows political leaders and religious leaders that you cannot be, like, uh, cannot be I cannot be like firm or like rigid in your ideas of religion, right? We think that kind of fluidity allows, and with that, I'll take closing of the idea. Opening. Okay, so the two big gaps in the off case are still unanswered. Why would these liberal ex communities exist in the first place? And two, you still can't leave to get to them. Liberal, li liberal, liberal communities continue to exist because of what Vikrant already comes and tells you, right? We live in the world of social media, we live in the world of checks and balances. And not that their only version of checks and balances are there's going to be more checks and balances, there's going to be more representation. They don't necessarily tell you what these checks and balances look like, right? And we think that these checks and balances are what will cause religion to be far more liberal and societies to be far more liberal on our side. When religious leaders and political leaders that are banking on religious vote banks look that people can now get up and leave as opposed to their, their side where they're stuck with no community, no fraternity, the moment they're slightly different or unable to like al align themselves to like the unified doctrine, we think on their side there is just no space to express yourself or to be yourself. That kind of cognitive, cognitive dissonance about your identity is only going to cause ruin. On our side, we think there's enough incentive to make sure that you make it a better place. I'll bet the delta might be small, but the only possible for change is on our side and not on their side. I think we take them on fulfillment, we take them on resources, and we are overall able to tell you that the religion is further on our side. Religious differences in a world where more and more identity, individual identity is important, is far more compatible with religion on our side. And for all these reasons, extremely proud to oppose. <laughs> speech on five, four, three, two, and one. I would have one rebuttal before my extension. 
They say that people can join liberal interpretations of religion. There are two responses against this. One, if there were really liberal interpretations of Christianity and Islam, it's very likely that you would have had secular movements in favor of these progressive ideas either way. So what that means is that if a person was really so determined to leave their religion, they probably would have been able to opt in things such as atheism, so just disassociating from their cult leaders and many of these religions, which means that on either side this benefit isn't really that important. But suddenly, if anything, we think that liberal interpretations of religion often come from secularism. So from the Pope meaning to appease world leaders and needing to oppose secular individuals. So on their side, you get smaller and smaller circles, many of them conservative interpretations of Christianity. You would have likely had those people never be able to reform. The comparative is because the religion is overall larger, they have to reform for everyone, which means that everyone gets the benefit of liberal interpretations either way. Now, our argument that we're going to run on is on why larger religions overall are more modern and more likely to be progressive, and less likely to have things with radical extremism and cults. So, the illustration for this is just simple. On up, you're more likely to get kooky, small conceptions of Christianity and Islam that looks like things such as ISIS, that works off of the most radical interpretations of Islam, that looks like Catholic gun cults in the US, the intensely conservative INC in the Philippines. God mentions this overall benefit, but they don't impact why this is very important, they don't meta it, and furthermore, they don't mechanize it as well. What is the mechanisms that we're going to run off here? The first two are just going to be based off why the central figurehead, i.e. people like the Pope, i.e. the central leader of Islam on our side, would likely not be radical. The first is just to say that the central figurehead for the entire religion has to appease the entirety of the religion. So they don't want to be the one to break the entirety of the church, insofar as they offer interpretations of belief that most people do not want. The comparative is, on their side, smaller and smaller leaders who appeal to smaller and smaller sects are able to only appeal towards their own sects, which often means you get more radical interpretations of these individuals, insofar as people's overall preferences aren't like as represented then. This doesn't just talk about this in terms of voting. So what they'd say is that the central figure that wants to appeal to the largest amount of like individuals within Christianity, which means it's very unlikely that you get an overrepresentation of one individual type of Christian. Instead, you get general beliefs that people are going to want to tend into. So what it often looks like is things such as interpretation of nonviolence. Insofar as people don't want to do violence on average against other individuals, that means that you get many of those benefits. Then the second thing I'm going to talk about is that there's a larger amount of strength from the central figurehead against individual priests or imams who want to do more radical actions and want to schism against the church. So this motion says states that the Pope had mechanisms to suppress dissent and alternative viewpoints. That looks like a higher amount of charisma for the Pope, which means that you get higher buy-in from these individual imams. It looks like the ability to off intensity radical imams before they even start their own interpretations of religion, which means that the central figure has more power to be able to off those radical interpretations. The last thing we want to talk about, which is intensely different from the open, was to talk about media incentives from the secular world. So on their side, the smaller leaders do not care about whether or not world leaders from the secular world, or even the more moderate sectors of the secular world, which tend to be like less conservative, like them or not. So on our side, those individual smaller leaders just do not exist. And what that looks like is cases where, for example, the Catholic Church as a whole had their form from their past sex scandals to a liberal Pope Francis, many other cases like that. So there are a few structural reasons why this will lead to things such as more secularism and generally just better progressivism within the church. One, the Pope and many of these central figureheads have to appeal to a broad range of leaders to make sure that Christians and like Islamists aren't prosecuted or don't have to undergo negative harms from central governments. So that, for example, looks like they'll want to appease the U.S. government or like Western liberal governments to make sure that they don't tax, they can tax like, church property as a whole, which means that they're less likely to be extreme. But the second thing is just to say that news organizations are more likely to cover like larger scale religions, such as, for example, the entirety of Christianity, rather than like a small town cult within like Western Alabama, which means that on average, because the central leader doesn't want to like lose space, it's far more likely that they appeal to a broad range of individuals and oftentimes do not turn towards the worst forms of violence. So that just means that we get far more accountability in general and that the individual leaders of these central religions are more likely to be good because they have to ease a broad range of individuals who can call them out generally. What are the impacts? The first thing I'm going to talk about is in terms of charity and the ability for the church to give good aid to many individuals. So there are two reasons why you get better things for this. One, it's not just economies of scale, but it's whether or not people are able to discuss what good charity even is. So on our side, there's a discursive mechanism where everyone within the church is able to hold the central leader to account and they're able to call them out on their bullshit. 
So what that means is that on our side, we don't have smaller and smaller sets of Christianity that are able to support really cookie and bad investments for charity. Just for example, in the Philippines, where millions upon millions of pesos were spent on a literal sex cult leader that was hiding under the guise of Christianity. On our side, the central figurehead like the Pope has to keep themselves clean. But it's not like to just say is that secular news organizations were able to cover these things. That's because there's only one central like structure in terms of investigating corruption, investigating whether or not priests are doing bad things or not. And what that means is a few things. One, when bullshit does happen, you're more able to call that out and have the entire church react to it. But suddenly, the individual pope is more likely to prosecute those things before they're even covered, which means that you're far less likely to have those individual cookie imams spending like money on bad things generally. And that means that you get overall more effective charity because one, you get more money put towards a central good resource. But suddenly, you don't waste money on the really bad things that these people often spend. Money on the tends to perpetuate corruption and bad things. I'll take the video now. You'd rather force the most oppressed individuals under the religion to abandon a core aspect of their identity rather than proving how a unified religion can make space for them. One, do they not deserve to have access to faith and fulfillment? Two, isn't that absence of an opt-out more likely to radicalize conflict against the leadership? One, look at the rebuttal. Two, I'm going to make that trade-off later on. There's something I'm going to talk about really quickly is on violence and corruption. So because there's no smaller and smaller circle, you cannot have rapid violence against these of the interpretations and indoctrination that individual people have. That means you get this case like ISIS, those sorts of things. But suddenly, over time, and thirdly, you get more liberal interpretations of the church overall, insofar as they have to keep themselves to account to the liberal secular world because they don't want to seem bad to them, insofar as they want to keep things like their tax benefits, it's more likely that you get this sort of thing. What are the impacts and how do you meddle them against them? The first thing to just say is that compared to everyone else, these are really important things. Because food, safety, the ability to not have to face violence from smaller and smaller sects of the religion, for example, what happens within ISIS to the rest of Islam, is the essential thing that lets you appreciate things such as community, lets you appreciate things such as religion. So insofar as we prove why we get more of this, based on less conflict, based on the ability to have more education and more like charity, which is effective, you're able to have those benefits on our side. But that's something to just say, is that compared to things such as LGBTQ rights, we propose that things such as food, shelter, the ability to appreciate these things and not be shot at, is generally just more central towards your ability to enjoy your life as a whole. The last thing I just want to say is that if you're really insistent about progressivism and liberalism, again, that happens more on our side. When the secular news world is more able to cover the entirety of the religion, right, the comparative, where some people are just always boxed out because they were arbitrarily born in the worst version of Christianity, we think that's better on our side compared to theirs. For us more, everybody. about religion and especially Islam because they talk about conflict but they don't talk about the living experiences of these individuals who live and experience this religion. This was like the Sunni, the Shia, and you and Muhammad yeah, that exists and branches within religion that has different interpretation not because they want to but simply because they have to due to the different context of their life, the different living experiences. What we allow on site closing opposition is the ability for this individual that are the most vulnerable to modify religion that is important to them to their own lifetime experiences. Framing. Firstly, note that this is a this house preferred motion, meaning we set the world to have the earliest adoption of the religion and left it being dominant with leader that has absolute power without any changes or modification on God's side. God has to accept this burden and this framing to access any of their benefit of lesser conflict and better unification. Why is this crucial? Two reasons. The first is that I want to emphasize the amount of power that is theatered on government to be that dominant, to destroy every single denomination and every different interpretation and discussion that OG tries to say. These are absolute power without any question. The second is the comparative onside God. Our world where Catholicism remains static, remains to a person where they kill and massacre the Turkish and the Muslim. That is the world that they have to defend to contribution. The first is radicalization and conflict, though I'm doing this for engagement, the second is sub-actualization of different practice. All only mentioned religions inside being more progressive, accepting LGBT.
activity yun as a trap. Good luck with that, Oo. So you're just going to tell you why is it that practices behind different denominations is extremely important. This is like Protestant Christianity rising from Catholicism. How Hindus are practiced differently in Bali compared to the ones in India. How Sunni and Shia, Nadatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah in Muslim. This can be conservative, unlike Oo, but at least it increases self-actualization. The first contribution, uh, yeah, responses to CGA, I just want to say CGA is extremely derivative from OG when it comes to conflict management and people living. That is, you know, impacting with slightly prettier work. The second is an argument about charity, like bro, religion is not a uh, business organization that helps out people. There are other organizations that helps out individuals. The Delta is extremely small. Watch out. First argument, you're going to talk about radicalization and conflict. What I'm going to do is explain why conflict is often symmetric or often worse off on the government side. There are five structural reasons here. The first is external forces that stops conflict, like mentioning peace and peacekeeping and etc. that can stop these types of conflict, so it's mitigated. The second is the source of conflict will still exist. Like, just because we are dominant as Muslim, doesn't mean Western imperialism, which is the reason why we have war in the Middle East, doesn't mean like the war for oil would suddenly stop on side government. There are external forces such as the greedy Western uh, you know, countries, that still want to destroy these types of religion and create this war. The third is small deviation doesn't mean that interest is, uh, you know, doesn't disalign. I.e., there are still individuals that are going to be pissed when the Catholic Church do massive corruption on their side, and those types of conflict can still exist under the same religion. The fourth is inter-religion conflict can still exist. Like, cross-conflict religion can still exist. Sure, there are Sunni and Shia, but tell me if the destruction of the Gaza Strip doesn't happen because of the differences between Israel Jews and Muslims in Palestine. Onside proposition, there are more likelihood of conflict on the fifth structural reason. There are three structural reasons inside the fifth structural reason. The first is competition is saturated to between religion. There are no incentive to be moderate on their side because your competition are saturated to those that are different than you. It's easier for you to become radical to fight against people that are different than you. It's easier for you to shut up on how different and how savages these type of people from different religions are because they're not your fellow brother under the same religion. The second is religion remains static. The adoption of the earlier religion are the most aggressive. Note that this is a reset motion, so they have to defend the earliest adoption, which are the most aggressive form of this religion, Catholic, massacring Jews, and Muslims. The third is leaders are crazier on their side. Note that they have absolute power with no check and balances inside those religions because they don't have denomination. They also have no interest to listen to these forms of discussion because there are no threat on their side. There are no threat of their you know, followers suddenly splintering to other denominations on their side, so there are little to no interest for them to listen. Then, the second, the way in for this is that A, conflict are often symmetric and not the impor most important clash within this debate. The second, or even at worst, we have already flipped a lot of government benefit or harm of conflict. No, thank you. Self-actualization. Why is it that side government actively will self-actualization, practice, and etc. right? There are three structural reasons here. The first is that government set discussion and co chamber is created. How likely is this? There are three structural reasons behind the structural reason. The first is that there are no interest from leader to cater this again due to absolute power that they have. B, they don't have the capacity for this. They are vastly different contexts that people live in. Tell me how different people live in the Middle East are compared to the ones that are in the West. They don't have the capacity and resources to simply cater to a lot of these different experiences and a lot of these individuals. The third is that it's hard to cater a lot of these different left experiences under one denomination. Religion has to be personal to your left experiences in order for you to relate and get a lot of the benefit that will be brought to you. And other people with left experiences are vastly different. Those most of that place in the Western has to not wear burqa in order to protect their life because they're against white people. The second is proximity, right? Religion are created by the elite. They wouldn't want to listen to the poor that are down there and cater to the different denomination that they would have. The third is that religion remains static. It doesn't improve at all. There are little to no interest to shift and create those discussions that Uji told you. They only say that they will have discussion. No mechanization on this. Uji. Our whole point is that these dominant religions are never bad in the first place to begin with, yeah. which still receives their response. Our response to that is that these dominant religions are likely to be dangerous due to five structural reasons that I gave to you. Why is it that freedom and self-actualization exist solely on psychosing opposition? The thesis here is that when you are allowed to have different doctrines and beliefs, you ought to have more freedom to practice. This is like Sunnisia, the Western development of Muslims that caters to liberal living. There are four structural reasons why this is likely. The first is freedom, because this individual has different living experiences. They don't have to depend on the Pope to come to them and salvage them. They can create their own denomination on the basis of their own knowledge, on the basis of the practices that they heard and the people around them. This is like different denomination of Islam that place differently because their experience are vastly different. The second is exposure when there are more options that you are exposed to. You ought to have more agency because you are increased of your option to access different types of religion that caters to your religion experiences. The third is resource allocation. You as a dominant religion don't need to allocate resources to cater different religion 
experiences. It's up to you yourself, the poor, the most vulnerable, to create your own religion and interpretation. The last is leaders are more happy to eat to different sects and denominations. When you have multiple denominations, leaders are habituated to hearing those discussions that they are so proud of on site opening government because they are used to all of those differences. The impact is A, some actualization, there's less compromise and easier for you to self-practice and practice this religion to your own negative experiences. The second is more incentive for leaders to see different interpretations. The last is agency and freedom to modify religion to the context of your sovereign. This is important in laying due to three reasons. A, this is the most important impact because the, those that are religious and need this vulnerable small interpretation are all the time only has religion because they don't have capital. This is the most important path to salvation to them. The second is this is logically prior to any conflict argument that they have because before people go to conflict, they need to practice their own religion first in their own safe space. This is why closing opposition goes through the route. Begin my speech in three. Oh, judges, are you ready? Okay. Begin my speech in three, two, one. For far too long, multiple sects of religion perpetuated the belief that they are better than their predecessor for the sole reason that they have had a better interpretation of religion to give people a quote unquote better lived experience based on the lie that it was for themselves to secure power from a church leader or a previous religious leader who they did not like and was a power grab for them at the very end of the day, which split resources, split vital information, and split huge amounts of free and like manpower and people which could have been used to better pro process later on. There are three primary win conditions which bring to the community side of closing gulf. First, is this make religion better? Second, where are individuals better off? And the third is where we create a better society overall should this new world have happened under our society house. The first question I want to answer is to directly respond to closing opposition. Are religions likely to change? And where have they changed much better off? This closing opposition's primary win condition, because this is the member of opposition speech. All of their premises are based on the assumption of government that our religion is static. So why this proof that, stat that statisticity does not exist in our side, that just can be modern, that we win, because they only rebutted the worst case in our case for all the structural reasons that Emma brought you earlier. The first response here is the, the burden proof closing opposition, and that they claim that we remain static, and that they have a 13th century crusading church where you know we harm we, or we harm Turks or we harm Muslims, etc. Note that their claim is that under their side we have their counterfactual is that they can have multiple sects of the church. But note, their underlying claim of having multiple sects of the church is based on the assumption that these multiple sects are, guess what, based on a modern church as well. So if they claim under their side that these multiple sects can be modern, they can't burn it for thoughts because they have a 13th century church because the church that they will be breaking off of will also be something that is modern under their side because they want to claim all the liberal values they want to under their side. So no, it's not fair for us to defend the static world under our side. But no, the closing opposition still wants to push the idea of statisticity. How do we respond to this? Note that we say this far worse off, and this is where we defend the trade-off, right? If you have to defend a world where it's a 13th century crusading church, where it's really bad, the church has lots of corruption, sacks, scandals, the church has lots of problems, why is it worse off if a sect from that point in time breaks away under their side of the house? The reason as to why it's worse off is because these sects will then attempt to become the most radical of the, of the Catholic Church, to get more followers as possible. If you buy into this the 13th century, crusading against Muslims, for example, crusading against, uh, like, uh, like, like, like in Israel, for example, this, this would mean that you get multiple crusades with multiple decisions, multiple leaders who would want to, you know, parade themselves around Europe as the best crusading, uh, like, the best crusading cohort to join, for example, to go to Palestine, for example. That's necessarily important because then you get more radical followers in their side of the house who will believe all these different leaders who necessarily want to be the best Christian in the eyes of God, to be the best person to save and liberate uh, like Palestine and Israel from the Muslims. So we say that even under our 
and elsewhere, we buy their convenient characterization where religion is not like this far, far worse because their side, which has to defend a, like, multiple sects arising from that same church, is still far worse of him when you have these sects competing in more violence as they claim it to be near their side. But also note that they never respond to the multiple characterizations we brought to you earlier as to why we are necessarily able to change the church should we buy the static characterization we got from them. Number one, we told you why there's less corruption necessarily because we have, the church wants to be able to maintain a good image, the leader themselves want to maintain a good image to begin with. But second, we told you why this threat is also less violence because more violence necessarily reduces church resources or you know religious resources unified, like unifying the all together, which is also far worse off. But lastly, it's also far worse off the hard minorities on their, on their their side. Uh, it's also far worse off the church hard minorities on their hard side of the house necessarily because you lose followers in that regard as well, and you lose out critical mass towards areas which you could gain more followers and gain more individuals from at the end of the day. Now, th then let's respond to opening opposition. The first thing I want to deal with is the tension in their case, because their win condition was to free people from oppression by having a less strict church. And then the alternative was to Google it. So I'm not exactly sure why people feel safe before they say Google it, the church themselves or the parents themselves are so oppressive to them. But number two, there's no clear counterfactual on their their side to prove why the alternative will be more liberal, right? So their claim is that the Bible does not necessarily allow gay marriage, or doesn't necessarily allow abortion. So presumably, if you break away into like modern sex right now, like Protestantism or, or the Orthodox Church, they still follow the same Bible. They still follow the same, like similar religious doctrines and religious texts, or the like the source material is generally the same. So I'm not exactly sure what the positive delta is to change if the source material for these very strict conservative things are still quite similar to their the house. But then they said you can Google it. The first response here is that it's not mutually exclusive. But number two, even if it was, they don't necessarily prove why you Googling something and knowing about it is want to make you change your life. That's the broad assumption that they made, the logical leap that they made, was never addressed in their dress like the house. But no, they may know about it, but that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily prove why they will automatically change or they have such a strong influence on you to necessarily be able to do it. And this is necessarily important because then you get more internal conflict on their dress side. So then you as an individual, knowing about, oh, there are these possible changes, but you can't change because your sect is so bad on you, makes it so that you yourself aren't able to break free from those shackles and you yourself will have more in, like, internal problems within yourself where you get less self fulfillment less self actualization in the very side of the house because of that. But let's weigh the comparative and the logical extent. Because the logical extent of our opposition is that you maybe get to change your lifestyle, but ultimately you change your lifestyle and extent of being isolated from your religion. On our side of the house, we agree probably being a long-term change, probably going to be slow at the beginning, but it's much better off than the safety net of the comfort of the people around you, necessarily be able to stay strong within your religion and be able to change it over time. Lastly, let's deal. Let's then deal with if conflict occurs on both sides. Why are we still better? On our side of government, we told you from first that it is likely to be an internal conflict. On opposition, you have conflict in different sides. The clear counterfactual, the clear split between both benches. Why do less in the state of harm? Number one, it's because they won't go all out on you because they won't be able to. The individuals will think twice before leaving the unified church because they have so much relationship. They have business partners in the church. They have family members in the church. But even if you don't buy this claim, the second reason as to why you would not want to go all out in terms of conflict is necessary because you have to waste more resources as a unified religion, as a church, to quell that conflict, because that conflict that like, like need to be larger, rather than having individual sex just break away under, under their side of the house, which you can do all the time. Before I move on, closing. Uh, don't you think when capital are separated on our side, they have less capacity to do conflict? At best, your mech is symmetric because wanting more followers and <coughs> wanting to not waste capital can exist within a religion with different denominations. Yeah, so if, you're ca so if you claim that you have less capital on your side, but also need to get to do less things like changing liberals within that, so like sex with sex itself, being able to change, like have discourse within sex itself, being able to do more charity work, for example, to help individuals on the ground on their side of the house. So if their counterfactual they want to find they have less resources to be able to do anything in general, then that just means that their that, that just means that sex are less efficient overall at the very end of the day. And this is necessarily important because then that proves why number one to our side of the house, we have less conflict even if you buy a very worst case scenario. But second, we also prove to you why reform is much more likely under our side under our side of the house at the very end of the day. The last thing here is to weigh out over opening government, why you weigh over them. The first reason is because necessarily opening up government impacts why individual solace is important, but we prove to you the larger macro benefits, the prerequisites to being able to have individual solace by necessarily being able to have the church and being able to have these religious groups, for this unified religious group, being able to help these individuals feel comfort, being able to help these individuals feel safe, which is a prerequisite to being able to find solace. But second is because we've necessarily told you why the interaction between secular and religious world is only possible when you have a unified religion and you make it much better for you to be able to, to, be able to make concessions and be able to acquiesce things under our side of the house. For all these reasons, propose. I'll be taking a point from opening at round five, probably. Um, starting my speech in 
three, two, one. Very quickly, why we're logically prior to all. First, CO talks about the key tenet to religion that applies beyond conflict and radicalization, which applies to very few people compared to how you get fulfilled to begin with. Second of all, all case is reliant on religion becoming progressive. An incredibly huge burden, I think it's unrealistic, because it's susceptible to government response of how religion is still going to be conservative, which we kind of agree with. CO case is on practice, which applies regardless of what your political leanings are. I'm going to first sell our extension because one, this will engage on OO's first main case they themselves mention as most important, which is fulfillment. Second, this overtake OO's huge burden and unrealistic case. Thirdly, I'm going to put our extension as standing compared to the marginal derivative extension of CG of just how to use money and repeating the process of conflict resolution. So their only response we got was, was to say, well, on CG, our, on CO, our case was all about static and being more liberal, not government burden to do that, which means our main extension has no response regarding the practice that apply regardless of the progression of religion itself. OG talks about fulfillment. They talk about how on our side, there's religious self-doubt. On their side, you automatically feel connected, feel closer. But if you're missing the capacity to practice or access the defined ways to do the religion, you then feel alienated on their side of the house. What do you get on CO? You adapt to different situations. OO talks about cognitive dissonance, but only examples of progress in religion that's unfortunately unrealistic even in 2023. What did we talk about? We talked about our different sects of religion with different practices, not just liberal versus conservative, but how you practice it even with, if you're conservative. We're talking about within Islam, the acceptance of praying jama, where you combine two prayers together because your work schedule and the availability of mosques is limited. How necessary it is to wear a hijab, especially if you're in the US or France, where it's an active danger to yourself if you wear it on a day-to-day -day basis. We talk about how acceptable it is for you to fast during Ramadan or replace it later on if Ramadan happens to fall during a particularly difficult part of your life where you're very busy, it is summer, or etc. This is what happens within Islam even in Indonesia. It's not about the level of conservatism. They're generally all conservative. But it's differences in practice. How do you do their azan multiple times or not? In Christianity, how you practice Lent, how you interact with Christmas, how often you go to church. These are all of the differences that you account for on our side. You don't have to be progressive. Just practice differently. That's something we are going to allow. Because we already talked to you in my member how most likely the practices you allow on, on their side is the first denomination, denomination based on the morality of the time, so it'll be extremely conservative. This isn't to say on our side of the house then it'll be progressive, but we will adapt it to different living conditions. So when opposition talks about how, uh, so when government talks about how uh, there's pressure to be different, you will internalize radical, you will not listen to other, uh, to other ways to practice, the externality still exists on how you can practice it, so you do change it. If you're unable to practice it in the way that the people back in the year zero or year 600 in the case of Islam, if you can't practice it, you'll pro try to practice it in a different way. On government, you actively invalidate these people who cannot pray a hundred times a day and can only pay 17 rakats a day. The ability to internalize the alternative is also something that we can claim because it is habituated over time. If they claim that the unity is habituated over time, we can also claim the ability to view other sects and view other uh, you know, and view other ways to practice the religion is something that's also habituated over time in reality, which is based on the reality point you defend. So you are then exposed to these alternatives. So you have these insights, which OG talks about how you can't possibly internalize any other views. We say you can over time. But thirdly, even engaging on the resource distribution, other than the ability to practice individually, how you conduct your resource distribution, as OG says in CK Extends, it's not just about quantity, but how you are able to conceptualize how you, dis uh, how, you di uh, how you distribute it. Different sects prioritize different levels of faith, and some people believe that schools have to be madrasa, some people believe that any pursuit of education is already getting closer to heaven and contributing to your, uh, contributing to your religion. This means that you don't only allow resource distribution for super traditional, very, very religious ways, but you're also willing to give scholarships, for example, for people going outside of religious schools on our side of the house because you believe that any pursuit of education is already good enough. Then different sects that this also includes different sects that believe believing traditionally is better, while some people believe in technology. This accounts for whether or not you're comfortable with technology rather than you're progressive or not. If you're comfortable with technology, then we're going to be able to allow people, uh, allow the allow the release institutions to fund, for example, digital, digital ways of preaching and sharing ways of talking about your religion. If you care about being traditional, we fund these ustas and these preachers to go all over the world and talk to them directly. We allow these different ways to distribute the resource on our side as well. This recontextualizes the OG process of getting more resource and see this limited impact on also more resource on how you're allowed to use those resources and whether or not they follow the tenets of religion to begin with. This is important because as OG says, this is your main purpose in life, your salvation of 
people seeking salvation on the afterlife, etc. The way for this is one, this applies to the most amount of part of religion. You don't have to go to conflict yeah, to get our benefit. Second, conflict is significantly smaller of importance. Lastly, even if there is conflict, the outcome is the options of practice that we get on our side of the house. Lastly, government's peace comes with invalidating and telling the non-dominant beliefs how to practice that they're wrong with no room to allow for different ways for people to practice. This is the most inherent case that exists in this debate. Before I move on to the other engagement, I'll take over. The CO case really doesn't need a whole new sect for a slightly different Christmas tree, especially with our proof that religions are less rigid in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it does. Because on your side of the house, in order to get that unity, you have to make sure that the religion is very, very strong and very, very fulfilling. The problem is, if you want to do that, you have to make sure you practice it in very specific ways, even with the different sects. They also do practice it, and they are also very, very strong in what they believe in. So on their side of the house, they can't just claim that, oh, our impact is too small. One, our impact is guaranteed. Second of all, our impact is based on the externalities that people live in. We don't believe that religion is the only reason why people conduct their lives. There are other reasons that affect your life, and we account for that on our side, making sure people can still access those benefits. On their side, they only talk about conflict. But even regarding conflict, First, my member already talked to, you, talked to you about the all of the sources of our conflict still exist. Externalities such as wars, externalities such as nations attacking your nation, that is making you run towards religion to be your salvation. This means that other different sects and the ability to uh, the inability to make sure that you stay peaceful still still happens. On top of that, when they talk about lack of interaction, my member also give you all of those reasons why if you're the only dominant, if you're the only belief, that means you have no incentive to moderate because there's no competition within that religion. If there is competition, that means they have those debates, which at that point means there is internal conflict, and the people who lose out in that debate feel invalidated by the religion, and there is conflict to be derived from that anyway. So the process, the creation of this conflict exists because there is always a process to choose what is the dominant religion. If the dominant religion is chosen through debate, whoever loses the debate will be very, very will be feeling unsatisfied by the religion anyway. At that point, you still get conflict, and it is very marginal. We also talk about conflict resolution mitigation. We already have security. We still have all of these incentives to keep things peaceful. So it's very marginal, keeping a way for you to practice your belief, regardless of whether or not it is traditional, is the only thing that's most important for all those reasons.